Perfect farmers growing together. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So um, I, I'll share a little bit of background. So uh, Rooted Farmers is, uh, is our company. We are, um, we're a, a software technology company for growers um, and, uh, and we really work as, as a marketplace. So um, think of Etsy as an analog where, you know, in Etsy you have crafters and artisans who are coming on one side of the equation and they're selling their products and um, you have buyers, consumers on the other side. Um, we work very similarly. The difference is that um, we have a really strong B2B presence. So wholesale buyers, florists, brick and mortar florists, um, event planners, event designers. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of the, the wholesale side of it. And then we also allow for segmentation there um, to, to support direct to consumer uh, sales. So your retail folks. <clears throat> Um, we're, most of us are growers. So I think that's probably, um, one of, uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that, that we really, our software is driven by farmers. Um, I'm a farmer. I live in rural New Hampshire. Um, we're, uh, historically zone B, but I think, uh, 4B, but I think this, this winter is throwing us for a loop a little bit. We have no snow on the ground right now, which is, um, never happened in January for as long as I've lived here. Um, but, but most of us are growers and, um, and that really informs how we, um, how we make decisions, how we think about the product, how we think about the software and who's using it. Um, and, uh, and so, so I think that's, um, something that, that I'm really proud of. Uh, we, because we're really growers first, um, we, we are a very mission driven team. Um, all of us are, are very focused on um, empowering small farms and, and mid-sized farms and making sure that um, they really are at the core of how we, um, how we build and, and how we show up in, in this space. <clears throat> I think we see ourselves um, contributing to this industry in a few different ways. Um, software is obviously first. Um, we are we are very well aware of um, kind of how, I guess the, the small and mid-sized farm community has kind of been left behind a little bit um, in terms of software and left to fend for themselves. And um, it's led to a lot of habits and systems that are, are expensive and time consuming that um, many of us just kind of try to put together ourselves. And it can mean that we're um, we are uh, texting back and forth with our buyers. It can mean that we're setting up whole, you know, websites to support our own operations. Um, it can mean that we're doing a lot manually. So pen and paper to just sort of kind of like iterating on an availability list. Um, all of these things take a lot of time. They come at the expense of, of the work that we could be doing, what we see as our real value add work. So being out in the fields and uh, producing more product and, um, and so software, I guess, is, is sort of the core of what we do, um, but we also, um, uh, we also do a fair amount in the education space. And you alluded to a little bit to some of the work we've done with collectives. Um, we have partnered with Lisa Ziegler and the Gardener's Workshop and building um, courses and podcasts with them, uh, with Jenny Love, with um, the Flower Podcast and Slow Flowers. Um, we also work with the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and we put on workshops. Um, for leaders in, in the collective space across the country. And so um, education is a core piece of, um, of what we do. And, and that's everything from kind of, um, you know, the traditional, you know, workshop type education down to producing content with um, these partners and on our blog. Um, I know you mentioned uh, earlier, kind of asking about what the trends are. Um, so you might find our most recent blog article um, Interesting. We talked a lot about um, what we saw last year um, in terms of you know what what was a top seller, what did really well, what surprises and, and opportunities are out there for growers this coming year. Um, so I would say hop hop over to our blog and and take a read of that because um, that's uh, I think that's there's some really exciting um, trends that we're seeing happening. Um, and then the last is is really community. We've got our um, our network is is comprised of thousands of members on the buyer and seller side um, across the country, and uh, and so I think that's that's a really important layer of what we do, um, and that's both in terms of you know our, our 
individual farms and, and wholesale buyers, and then also collectives. So um, all of these dots are uh, collectives that we work with. We work with a couple dozen collectives across the country and um, have been, uh, you know, I think we see those as, as really critical partnerships to scaling farming in, in the U.S. here and allowing us to um, take advantage of economies of scale and, and pooling resources as growers. Um, I don't need to spend a ton of time on this slide. I think, you know, it, it really, um, our community is, has really been the reason that we've grown is um, not that we've done a whole lot in marketing, but that um, I think a lot of our members are, are really just sharing uh, with their communities, just what, what a difference the tools and, and um, software has made in their business. And it frees them up again to, to be able to either not have to hire <laughs> as much, which I think is um, something that many of us are struggling with right now is um, just finding labor resources. Um, so if we're eliminating the manual tasks that we had been, um, you know, sort of really heavily in, ingrained in our business models, um, now we've suddenly found time. We've, we've freed up time and now we have time to reallocate to other things, whether that's other parts of your business or, um, or within your, you know, kind of your family and, and personal life. Um, but I think that's, um, that is, uh, that's why we do what we do. Um, Designer testimonials, I think, are, are the core of how we think about product design um, from, from their perspective, is really understanding how do they think, how do they want to shop, what, what are they looking for, what makes sense about how we talk about product and what doesn't make sense to them. Um, and, it, you know, this, is, this was really kind of the light bulb moment for, um, for, for me was, you know, when we first built the very first version of Rooted, uh, years ago, we uh, our, our, we had been running a collective using availability lists um, and working with these buyers we'd had relationships with. And on day one, when they started shopping, they doubled or tripled what they had been buying. And we went out and we said, why? Why, why did you do this? Why did you start spending more money? And the answer was universal. It was because we preempted. We answered all their questions. It was all tied to communication. And so we found that if we could solve for communication issues, we could suddenly just shift what we thought was the ceiling of their purchasing power um, and, and they would start spending more money. Um, so that was really exciting for us. Um, you know, I think we, we, can, we can kind of talk through what, um, what all, of our, uh, all of our different layers of impact are, but I think that's probably not um, as exciting as just getting a sense for what what the tools actually look like um, and, and why they're effective when you're trying to sell product. Um, I can hop right into that. I can pause there for questions, but you tell me, Carla, what, what makes sense. Any questions for Amelia so far? All right, Let's okay. moving along. <laughs> All right. Hi, oh, sorry, great. I have a question. Okay, great. Amelia has a question. Hi, um, my name's Amelia too. So <laughs> that's great. Nice, and there's another nice Carla here you. too. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. Um, I'm familiar with Rooted. Um, I've been following what you guys have been doing. I, I think the platform's amazing and I'm very interested in it. Um, I've been chatting with some other flower growers in the New York area, Hudson Valley, specifically about starting a flower collective to potentially use your platform but it's kind of hard to know where to begin in terms of what kind of entity to form llc how to set things up just more of the logistics um so i'm wondering if you could speak to that at all and then what might be a good way to take conversations offline <laughs> Yeah, so um, we, I guess my first response is you should take a look at the course if you haven't already, the course that we built with Lisa. Yes, um, I have. You have watched it. Yes. Okay, so, so I think that's the first step. Um, we try not to advise too, too heavily on entities without actually having conversations with folks. I think it's, it is very, um, that there are pros and cons to every entity type. It's very specific to your group, to your group dynamics. Um, you know, I think there are some groups that could work great when you're thinking about uh, co-ownership models. And there are some groups that would just sort of stall out and, and 
not make a lot of progress. Um, and so it's, it really, it totally depends on your makeup and your experience and, um, and who is sitting at the table. Um, so I don't think there's one right answer, um, which is, is probably not what you want to hear. Um, but it, it, it's it, what it's I thought really you would question. say based on what you say in the course also, but I figured I would take the opportunity to ask while I had to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, there are big pros and cons. I think anytime you're, you're increasing the number of people at the table, um, your the big pro is you've got more people who can lend a hand and help out and feel incentivized. And the big con is that you have more people who need to get to a consensus in a decision. And, um, and sometimes that's great. And sometimes it can really stall. And so it, there's not a, there's not a silver bullet. Um, I, it really depends. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, so, uh, this is what it looks like for a pretend buyer. So we'll just start here and kind of looking at, um, you know, what does the experience look like and why is it like this for buyers? Um, you know, we, we, this is the product of years of research with our, uh, with our buyers and, and really trying to understand <clears throat> how are we talking about product as growers? Um, and what makes sense about that to you? And how are we talking about it as growers that doesn't make sense to you? And so um, there, there's a learning curve there. And there are kind of three different paths that buyers tend to fall into when, they, um, when, they, when we look at their shopping habits and their behaviors and their preferences. And so I guess the first here is just to understand, you know, when, um, when a buyer is looking through product the, the first uh, category, I guess, in no particular order is, is what I would call just kind of a window shopper. Um, they just want to look at everything. They want to see everything that's available, whether it's from just one or two growers or um, from a collective of growers, they want to just scroll. And so they want to go through all of the product. Now, again, this is all pretend product. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. These are, this is a, a demo environment here. Um, but it's, it's really intended to, to show kind of what that experience looks like. Um, buyers like to blow up the photos. They like to see, this is one of the big shifts from an availability list to really seeing some, a platform like this that they can interact with, um, is that they are visual people. They like to see these descriptions that growers can put into their own products. They like to understand um, all of these different product attributes. You know, what is the stem link? How much is available? Um, and, and really just understand the details of it. Um, as growers, we care often about um, the botanical names and, and need to understand what we're actually harvesting. But as buyers, they typically, unless you're getting into some of those Dahlia varieties that they are seeking specifically, you know, they, they are looking more by, um, by the photos than they are for a specific item. Um, so, so I guess that's, that's the first way is our window shopper. Um, the second way is really uh, what I would say is the most common, which is that they're shopping for an event. And so they're saying to themselves, okay, I have uh, an event next week and the color palette is, we'll say, um, coral and uh, pink and burgundy. I'm just making this up. But now show me everything that falls into my color palette. Um, or show me all of the focal flowers that fall into my color palette. And so they really prefer to shop in this way. This is something that if you've been to the way that they like to think about their product, remember they are coming at it from an artistic perspective um, and they're thinking about it from recipes um, that they have started working through with their clients. Um, if you allow them to shop in a way that makes sense in their brains, they're going to feel comfortable shopping for more product and, and buying more product. And so um, I think that is, that is something that um, we have learned as we've gone through this process. So that's the second category um, is really, uh, you know, kind of building a tool that allows them to shop by event, essentially. Um, and then the third is, is what we were talking about um, with, for searching for a specific item. So they are able to search any of the um, product names or keywords, common names, things like that. So I'll just type in Celosia because I know we have some in here. And then they can see all of the Celosia that is available for them. They can blow up the photos. 
Um, and when they're ready to add it to their cart, they can do that. So they can select from whatever constraints you've given them and we'll go into what that looks like on, on the grower side, um, add it to their cart. And then they've got their cart. This was a big, um, a big revelation, I think, um, that is particularly uh, important when you get into more saturated markets, when you have more florists all shopping simultaneously. Um, this is, it, it's a big differentiator from Shopify. Your product is not reserved in your cart if you're a buyer on Shopify. Um, and so if you've got multiple buyers shopping at the same time, they're all competing for the same product. They go to hit that checkout button and half of their cart disappears. Um, this is particularly important for collectives because um, when we watch kind of what the traffic looks like, collectives will notify their buyers that the shop is open and you know they'll do that at six o'clock in the morning and at 6.01 a.m. traffic for the entire site just spikes and everybody is coming on at the exact same minute because they're trying to reserve product. They get an hour here to check out and that product is theirs for that hour. Now, if they don't buy it, it goes right back into the inventory for those growers and collectives, but for that one hour, they can shop. That has allowed them to feel comfortable to breathe through their shopping experience and it makes them spend more money. They end up spending more money because they can relax. So previously, what they would do is say, I'm only going to focus on the things I absolutely have to have for this event and then anything else I can get from my distributor. Because we've given them this space to relax through their shopping experience, they end up browsing. They end up spending far more money because they now are able to get comfortable, comfortable um, placing orders and, and browsing through things that they maybe were not aware of. They maybe didn't have time to look for. Maybe it wasn't in that like top tier of things I had to get from a local grower. Um, and so they would, they would just sort of relax into that shopping experience and then end up again, buying more product. They can add notes to their orders. Um, they can keep a credit card on file. They actually can trust uh, sellers. So they're able to um, they're able to say on their side, you know, who they trust as a seller, um, and give you permission to run their credit card when they're placing orders. So um, that can be really helpful if uh, if they are um, regular buyers, if they are uh, you know wanting to be able to call you and say, hey, I need you know five more things uh, for next week that I wasn't expecting, and you can build an invoice and immediately have all their payment information on file. Um, I'm going to hop over here to the grower side um, and we can take questions after. I'll just kind of run through what this looks like. So again, uh, as a grower, you're able to manage both wholesale and retail. Um, if you were a member of a collective, you would also see that show up here and you'd be able to manage that independently. Um, but essentially you're, you're setting your default settings here. So of my wholesale buyers, you know, which um, which of my products do I want to allow them to see? Um, and so I can decide by category, you know, do I want them to shop my straight bunches? Do I want to shop, um, let them shop from my buckets, uh, bouquets, dried flowers, and so on. So you're, you're enabling different categories. You have the same settings for your retail customers. So if you want to enable the same category for both, you can do that. If you want to disable for one, you can do that too. Um, you're setting your default settings here. So if you want your default to be Wednesday pickups, this will apply to all of your relationships, all of your new connections that you make. Um, if you want your default delivery to be, uh, to be Wednesdays, you can do that too. If your default delivery fee is $10. So again, it's just eliminating you having to set that up for every customer um, independently. You can manage order cutoff windows. So if you wanna stop taking orders at a particular time, your shop just closes at that time. So it, it, again, just sort of eliminates the mental burden of having to manage for that. Um, we will, I didn't save my changes and I'll leave it, that's fine. Um, we will hop over here to our products page and just look at what, um, what that looks like for growers. So um, when we're thinking back to sort of what that buyer experience looked like, um, they were able to see a whole lot of information some of that is provided by the grower, but much of it is provided by our team. And so we, um, we 
have what we call the flower table. We have a, a big database of thousands and thousands of cut flowers. Um, and what it means is that as a grower, all you have to do is select the item from the drop down menu that you're growing. Um, so you just type in, you can type in the common name, you can type in the cultivar, you can type in the genus, um, and you'll see all of the options there. So um, we'll just say we're selling Benry's Giant. You're going to choose the color that you're selling. Um, this is really, again, thinking about that buyer experience, they are um, shopping by color palette. And so if you have things that are mostly pink, you should call them pink. If you have things that are, are mostly coral, you should call them coral. And then you can always add the context in your description field. Um, you're pricing by the stem, you're selling by the bunch. Um, this is again, a product of, of really thousands of buyers talking about what it is that they want. How, how can we make their lives easier when shopping from us as growers and standardizing bunch sizes is a really important layer of that for them. They like to do very easy math when they're figuring out what they need to shop for in their recipes. Um, and fives and tens are, is just really easy. It's also pretty standard practice um, from, from most wholesalers, from most types of flowers. Um, generally fives are for larger things, sunflowers, hydrangeas, dahlias, sometimes peonies, um, and tens are for pretty much everything else. Um, stem length, you're choosing a range. Again, this is contextualizing pricing. So if a florist is looking at your product and you've priced your zinnias at $1.20 a stem, that price doesn't make a ton of sense to them unless they know what they're buying. Is it a very versatile long stem? Are these, are we talking about 18 inch stems or is it $1.20 a, a stem for a 10 or 12 inch stem? Because I would pay different prices depending on the stem length. So you're trying to give them a sense of, you know, what, what is the approximate um, stem length for this product? You're able to share vase life. You don't have to, you're able to share bloom size. I only do that with dahlias because they can be hard to um, just tell scale from a photo. And then you're adding your own photo. This is another piece that is really driven by buyers. They don't want to know what your product is supposed to look like. They don't want to see stock photos from Johnny's or from any other seller. They, they really want to know what your product looks like. And so you're pulling from your image library here. You can just dump all of that from your phone. Um, I just keep an album on my phone of, you know, farming pictures and I just throw it up there um, when I need to, when I need to add new photos. And I do most of this from my field too. Then you're adding your product availability, again, listing in terms of bunches and you can share your dates. Or if you wanna just go through in the winter time, which is what most of our growers do and add any new product that they're selling, um, they are able to do that. So you don't lose anything if you are done selling something, you just would archive it for, uh, you just would archive it for the season. So you can see here it says archived and then you can view um, all of your product by status. So I'm gonna just kind of clean it up here and say, show me only what I have active so that I can take a look at that. So now I can search my own product the same way that buyers could search their products. Um, and I'm able to very quickly see what do I have listed. So if I'm wanting to know, do I have you know, a particular dahlia, I would just search for dahlias or I would search for that, that item and then I'd be able to pull it up. Um, you can, you can hop in here anywhere you see a pencil tool, you can make edits, you can, uh, change prices, you can change quantities. Um, I tend to just say, okay, do a quick scan and say, what do I have available this week? Is it the same as last week? If not, I'd pull whatever was finished and then I'd select everything and I would update my fulfillment dates and say, yep, I'm going to update this so that it's available for the next. Typically I do one week at a time. Um, so we'll just call it that update. And now I've updated all of my availability for the week. I'd quickly run through, update my quantities. Again, I do this in the field because it takes me two seconds um, and it's just faster. As I'm walking, I'm just kind of checking all my crops and then I plug in what I have for the next week. Um, I This is a new tool that actually just came out this week that we're really excited about. Um, it's not part of the basic subscription, it is the pro subscription, um, but we, we've we had a lot of, um, a lot of discussions with folks uh, about how do we provide transparency um, 
to the industry on pricing. And so I think this is something that um, we're really excited to have out there for the world now, um, which is our pricing tool. So this is, this is giving you a sense for what is this particular product trading at? What is, what is the market pricing for this product? Let's look at it right now in aggregate. Let's look at it over time. We can make a decision about how we wanna view this. We can see where most sales fall here. We can see where the median price is. Um, these again are all wholesale. You are not looking at any retail pricing. You're looking specifically at wholesale um, sales to florists, designers, grocery, things like that. Um, and then you get a sense for what are the different pricing factors that can drive price and, and what is expected here for this. And you know, when we're looking at where most, most sales fall, um, how, how do we contextualize that further? And we're really getting a sense for what is, what is standard for this product. Um, so I think this is, this is something we're all really excited about to have out there for the world. Um, we'll take a look over at the buyers. I'm kind of running through this because I want to make sure we have time for questions afterwards, but we'll take a look at the buyers list. So this was, uh, a, a product of just as growers, how do we think about these relationships in our human brains? Like, how do we decide, do we wanna work with this particular buyer or not? Um, and, it, and it really does come down to a lot of um, not automatable inputs. In other words, I, if, I, if you are um, someone who is really far away from me, I might wanna work with you occasionally, but I'm not gonna consistently deliver in that direction then it might not make sense for me to always have my product available for you to shop for. Um, and I don't want to give you the experience of you come on, you start buying my product. And then I say, actually, I'm not coming your way this week. That's, that's a, that's a crappy experience for most buyers. And so we don't want to give that. Um, we just want to, we just want to prevent it up front. Um, or if you are only doing pickup this week, you're not offering delivery. You want to be able to allow for that it really becomes a one-to-one -one relationship for wholesale buyers. And you wanna manage those differently. You wanna give them different um, constraints on when you would deliver to them, when you would allow for pickup, maybe their delivery fees should not be the same. And so it's, it's really understanding there's not a one size fits all for most of us in how we think about our buyer relationships. And you know, sometimes if somebody's a mile around the corner from my house, I'm gonna let them come pick up five days a week. But if they're 30 miles away and I have to deliver, I'm only going to give them delivery one day a week. So you have the ability to differentiate here in that way. Um, and then they have their own personalized order cutoffs that are all um, factors of whatever you have set up in, in your store settings. Um, you can turn people on, you can turn people off. Um, they don't know that you've turned them on or off. All they see is no product available at this time. So it's not, um, you know, we tried to try to keep that very private. Um, you can manage your requests the same way that you would on something like Facebook um, or Instagram. If you've got um, people wanting to work with you, you are the gatekeeper of your relationships. We're never going to tell you, we, we are not going to um, decide for you who you're working with. Um, so you can manage those requests here. You can decide to accept them or not, leave them in limbo. Um, and then you can take a look through you know, who, who is near you and you're going to see all of the folks who already are on board if you're if you have new buyers who have come on, you're going to get notified um, that they have come on, and then you can hop in and connect with them. And again, all your default settings just um, just uh, apply right there. You can notify all of your buyers that you have products. You can do that right from here. Um, you're able to. I'm actually going to do that from over here. Let's see. Okay, so you're able to see all of your buyers here. If you were to turn some of your buyers off, you would see that they were disabled. So you can select all, um, you, can so you can deselect all, you can select only a few of them, and then you can send them a personalized message. So typically what we see is growers um, or collectives will you know, just set up all their settings and then they'll send out a message when they're ready to open their shop. Um, and again, because this all takes just a couple seconds, it, you're just freeing up all of those minutes and hours that you would have spent um, crafting emails and messaging and managing all of those systems um, with, your, with your buyers sort of in, in different places. 
Um, let's see, we're hopping between a couple different places here. So we'll take a look at orders now. Um, so this is to give you a sense of what your orders pages look like. Um, you can see uh, the difference between invoices that you've created or um, pre-orders that have come in. Um, if you wanna pull all of your orders for a particular date. So we'll just say, we wanna look at, show me everything for January 11th. And now I wanna create a harvest list. And now I have my harvest list and I can see any notes that were on the order. Um, I can see any messages from the buyers. I can see all of the aggregated products that I'm, uh, that I'm needing to cut. And I can also see who it's going to. Um, this, this is important for some folks and it's not always important for others. Um, in our collectives case, we have a few buyers who we harvest differently for. We know that they either really like a lot of movement in their stems or they really dislike a lot of movement in their stems. And so it's really helpful for us to see um, who are we cutting for with particular, uh, with particular um, items. We can hop right into the orders. So if we find that we actually don't have something and we need to sub something out, we'll just reduce that, update the order. No, I don't wanna add it back to my inventory because it turns out I actually don't have that. Maybe I got hit by a microburst and so now I don't have that. But I do have, let's see, we'll just pick something else and pretend I do have this. And so I'm gonna add that item as a substitute. Um, I can see the audit trail here, which is really helpful for me when I'm going back into my orders to try to get a sense for you know, what, a, what happened on a particular order. The buyer also sees that. Um, and, uh, and then you also have the ability to just put notes in here um, and, and keep track of any changes on orders. You can process payments right from here. So we'll just hop into this order. Um, so we'll say you're ready to process the payment. You can either run it with the card that's on file. You can swap it out to another card. You can run it as cash or check or Venmo or whatever you're taking. Um, and you have the flexibility to make a decision there. If you need to flag an order, if you want to print an order, um, you're, you're able to run all of that through here. You see your pending orders here. Um, again, this is a pretend version of our farm. So we're looking at a lot of outdated stuff, um, but you'd be able to very quickly pull up all of your past due orders if you wanted to just give them attention. Um, you can create a new invoice. You can pull it from your existing relationships or you can check out as a guest. You can apply your retail prices. So if for retail, you're choosing what your markups are and it'll just automatically run everything through. If you're choosing pickup delivery. You can kind of keep track of um, all of that and um, pull in you know, whatever makes sense there. And then you're able to just create those invoices here. So this is an example of an invoice and we can see um, this is, you know, we'll say this is a buyer who called and didn't, wasn't on the, uh, wasn't on the website and wasn't placing their order and just said, I have this last minute thing. Could you create, you know, could I, could I come and pick this up? And then you create the invoice and um, are able to keep everything in one place. The reason it's really a game changer for growers or one of the reasons besides freeing up all of your time, besides allowing you not to do all of the manual work that you're doing with availability lists and relationship management and all of that um, is that it really allows you to um, see your, the, assess the health of your business, see what's doing well and what's not doing well. Um, where do you have opportunities and to improve and, and where do you, um, have some areas that um, you know you feel like are are uh, kind of doing doing really well. Um, so that is all because you're keeping all of your sales in one place. So what we're looking at here is um, a snapshot of uh, your order volume. You're looking at it over the course. So in this case, we're looking at uh, last year. We're looking at it on a monthly basis. If you want to look at it over a shorter time frame, you can. And weekly, that's up to you. Um, you can see kind of over your lifetime what, uh, what has done well. You can look at your sales by buyer um, or your, oops, that one's not working here. This is our pretend environment. Let me pull it up here. Maybe we'll pull it up. Um, maybe Carla, if you're on, you can pull one up in, um, in our other environment. So we'll, um, we'll look here at our sales by flower type. Um, this is again because of how you've listed product. 
So if you remember how you created all of those product listings, um, you chose a particular variety of zinnia. And so we're able to see here that your top selling flowers are zinnias. Um, if you want to look kind of across them, you can look at your top 10, you can look at your top 20. Um, and you can see what's doing really well. Um, and then as a percentage of your sales, you know, zinnias clearly are a top selling item for this pretend farm. Um, and, uh, and we can see kind of how many different varieties just at a, at a glance there. So if we hop into zinnias, we can see specifically which varieties did well. Um, this is how we crop plan now. It's how we really think about um, what, what did really well, what didn't do as well, what do I feel like um, I had a lot of excess of and, and didn't sell, and what do I feel like I, I really sold out of, and um, getting a sense for what my sales looked like um, over, over that period is, is really critical. Um, we have a number of other types of analytics. I think I'm going to just pause there because it looks like the chat has got a lot of questions in it. So um, I'll just I'll pause and, and maybe um, you can share some questions. And one thing I'll just mention, Amelia, when you go to that report, is just if you um, select last year's date. Uh, oh, I had la I had this year, which is empty. Okay. Yes. Last year. Then it will populate. Great. Okay, so we'll just look, this is an example of kind of examining your sales by buyer. So you can sort them by, you know, who are your largest buyers, who are your smallest buyers, um, you know, where do you want to give attention to if you wanted to look at it on a weekly basis and see, you know, what does their fluctuation look like over the course of the year, who are your consistent buyers versus people who kind of once a month maybe placed an order. Um, and that is... That, that is something that can really help you to understand where do I need to spend my time in managing my relationships? Are there folks that I need to get on the phone with and talk to more um, to try to encourage them to, to just more consistently order? Um, yeah, let's see. I think, let's look at last year. Um, you can get a sense for what's, you know, this is again, more of a collective feature. I think that's helpful if you're selling through a collective, um, you can see what's selling on the market floor versus pre-orders that came in in advance of market day versus point of sale orders. Um, but but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there and, and we can go to questions. Any questions? And one thing I'd love for you to mention too, that you have two different levels of pricing and both are really affordable. Um, my husband's actually in the bread business and we looked into something like this similar uh, for the bread business and it was like thousands of dollars a year. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are all farmers and, and I think what, you know, we, um, it's really critical that we keep this an accessible price point for small and mid-sized farms. Um, so that subscription fee, we really try to keep uh, just at a manageable level. Um, we don't want to push people to, you know, spend a $20,000 software licensing fee before you even know if you're <laughs> going to sell anything or use it. Um, so, so we really approach this more as, you know, we would like you to have some skin in the game right up front uh, with, with a small subscription fee. And then um, we really only make our money when you make money. So we, we have a transaction fee. Um, it's actually lower than Etsy's transaction fee. Um, so we're at five percent is is what we take from every sale. Um, and what we find consistently is that growers are far more profitable when they're using this because you cannot hire in um, labor for for the price that you're you're able to sell, uh, basically recover um, from from that transaction fee. All of the labor hours that you're recovering all the time you're freeing up. Um, just translates to to profit and ultimately increase sales too. Um, I, I have another question. So, um, if you if we are thinking about setting up a collective, um, we would look at a collective plan first and foremost, and then for the individual growers who wanted to sell, um, would they each be paying for their own essential plan under that? 
Yeah. So, so we look at collectives a little bit differently than we do as individual growers. Um, so for an individual grower, you're applying to join rooted. So we'll just talk about what it looks like outside of a collective. Um, you're applying to join rooted and, and that's, that's really because, you know, we've made commitments to our buyers, um, that we are, we are controlling the supply chain. We're really managing who is coming in here, who is selling, um, we are uh, careful to, to really make sure we're bringing on American grown product um, first and foremost. And then second is that it's really high quality product. You know, folks who have been growing and selling um, wholesale for, for some number of years. And it's not that, you know, it, it's um, as much as we want to be supportive of new growers and, and people who are, are just sort of starting out on their farming journey. Um, that can be a really steep learning curve that um, can can be hard for the buyer community that we have who's expecting um, really experienced growers. So so all growers are applying to join Rooted. Um, you can do that. So I, I am logged in here. So this button says dashboard, um, but uh, we'll hop over here to the farm. So this is our public website. This is what it looks like if you go to rootedfarmers.com. Uh, and then you can hit the get started button and it would take you to create an account and fill out an application. That is a similar process for collectives, but I will say it's a, it's a much more um, intense uh, process of, of uh, review, I guess, and, and collaboration. Um, we kind of have two different paths of where we work with collectives. Um, the first is for established collectives. So if you've been running your collective and, and um, and have been at this for several years and, and are uh, experienced in just trying to change systems. Um, that's, that is one path. And, and those are kind of discussions where we meet to decide, do we all feel like this is a good partnership? Um, it's a similar path, but, but a different sort of bar for collectives that don't exist yet. Um, mm -hmm. That, that I would say is really the path is through our grant program. So um, you can find that on our blog. Also, if you kind of look back at last year's, we have not released it yet for this year. Um, but typically when we're partnering with a new collective that doesn't exist yet, um, it's applying through that grant program because it's, um, it gives you a free subscription for the collective for that year. Um, yeah. but it also gives you coaching. And um, that's something that we've found is really critical in partnering with new collectives is that um, we having that structure around monthly meetings and, and, um, and, you know, building in systems for your group, um, is a, is the way to kind of mitigate risk of making the very big mistakes that can tank a group in its first year or two. Uh, yeah, that sounds incredible. I actually wasn't aware of that. And, um, so I think someone sent the link around, so I'll definitely check that out. I'm um, so but you're talking about also individual farms can sign up to sell their product through Rooted, yep. correct? Yep. And how is that, um, how are those typically fulfilled? I, I must have missed this. Like, is that fulfilled? Like, as you said, like it can be in-person pickups or is it product that's shipped or can you talk about that? Yeah, so we don't, we don't allow shipped product from anybody except for the Alaska Peony Cooperative. Um, they don't have a local market. And by the time their peonies come on, they're not cannibalizing any of the lower 48. So they're the only ones who are allowed to ship. They know how to ship. They're, we've been there. We've visited their systems. We know they can do it. Um, nobody else is allowed to ship product on Rooted that all the fulfillment is physical fulfillment. So somebody is coming to you and picking up, you're at a farmer's market, you're at a, you know, bringing product to, to a market or you're delivering to the buyer. So those are really the paths for fulfilling orders. It's everything you're doing right now. It's just us giving you the software to be able to manage that in a way that's not you having to keep everything in your brain or keep five different systems that you're, um, that you're, trying to mesh together and, and not drop a ball as you're juggling um, that end up taking you a lot more time. Thank you. That makes sense. I appreciate it. Yep. And so maybe talk about a little bit of the sort of chicken and egg of the sellers versus buyers. Do sellers find it easy 
to get their florist or wholesale customers on board with using the system? Or do you have to nudge them a little bit? I mean, it's and maybe even speak to the fact with the for the new folks in here about approaching florists and working with them or any other wholesale situation. How do you get sort of into that and then bring them on board with you if you do opt to use the system? Yeah, so I guess there are a few different layers of that question. Um, it depends on the buyer. If you are talking with a buyer who has been uh, a florist for 40 years and using the same systems for 40 years, um, and just feeling a little bit, you know, like a stick in the mud, it might be hard. It, it might be hard. That's why invoicing is there, is that if they want to call you and give you their order, you still want to be able to keep everything in one place so that you don't drop a bucket somewhere. You don't forget about something. So that's why invoicing is there. What we find is that as you're creating these invoices, they get emailed, they can go in and view it themselves. And so then they're very like, they get comfortable at a different pace eventually they get there. It's very unusual that we see somebody is just like refusing to do it for years and years. Like that's, I, I don't even know of a case where that's happened. Um, for folks who are tend to skew a little bit younger, a little bit more comfortable with technology, um, they actually like, this is their preferred way of shopping. They spend more money for a reason. Like they prefer to shop in this way as opposed to having to sift through an availability list. When we have conversations with buyers who are shopping on an availability list, what they will tell us is if they don't know what it is immediately, they just won't even think about buying it. They just won't even think about it unless they're just, they happen to be there and, and they're looking at it and they're having a conversation with you. But if they're moving through their season quickly, which is you know, I think Carly, you had mentioned that um, you've got a lot of event venues out there that are hosting these destination weddings. Um, those florists, if they are cranking through a few events every weekend, they're going to be very efficient with their time and they're not going to be incentivized to go back and forth unless they really just can't get product. They're going to take the easy path, the path of least resistance, and that's whatever is easy for them to grab. So if they know they've got to grab dahlias, that's what they'll do. But if you make it easy for them with this sort of system, then they're spending more money and it's because they prefer shopping in that way. That initial, you know, you need to fill out an application. We have a lot of resources on that. We've got um, some articles here about building new relationships with buyers. We have buyer resources. Um, Carla from Rooted, you can tell us where we've got like a PDF handout of, of things you can hand to your buyer about um, you know, what is the rooted platform? How do you, uh, how do you hop on and start shopping? It takes you less than five minutes to create an account. Um, and, uh, and so she can put a link to that into our system. We also have a lot of, um, into the chat here. Um, we also have a lot of, uh, buyers who we partner with to provide content and advice. And how do you think about, um, how do you think about working with growers and, and what is appealing to you? Um, and I can say from our side, we always collect the data on why, um, why buyers are looking for local product. And um, they really fall into a few different categories. Um, but number one is quality. So they're really looking for those high quality products that, um, that they can't get from their importer. Um, and they know that they can reliably get them from their, uh, from their local growers. And so often what will drive them in is high quality dahlias, high quality zinnias, and that's what they're coming in for. And then they see all these other things and you know, it's like a kid in a candy store and then they start buying more product and that just grows the relationship. So, um, so it's, it's, it's not like a silver bullet immediately. You're not just, I mean, there are going to be some people who will flip the switch and be like, great, awesome, done. But there are going to be some people that you kind of have to help along. That's expected. That's expected when anybody's changing their systems. Um, and then it ends up paying up off for you as you as you kind of get through that transition period, which usually takes a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, and everybody's happy with that, with that outcome because you're saving time, they're saving time, they're spending more money, so you're making more money, and they're able to shop in a way that's just really convenient for them and and works the way that their brain works around um, around thinking about design. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. 
And Carla put the brochure into the chat so you can see that um, and that can be really helpful for you. A lot of really good tips in there. How large does your operation realistically need to be to consider wholesale? Um, we have everything from micro farms selling on a quarter of an acre all the way up to 20 or 30 acre farms um, that are, are, you know, most of that space is in production. So um, it really, it, it really varies. I think it depends on, you know, what are your other channels? Are you, you know, the biggest thing that your florists are going to want if you're not selling through a collective is consistency. They want to know that they can rely on you. They don't want to have you pop up one week and then disappear for three weeks and then pop up again and say, oh, I have this thing. They build trust with you as you are consistently showing up one week after the next. And so, you know, as far as building new relationship goes like that, that is a really critical piece of it is that they, their brand depends on you um, and being a quality producer and, um, and they're going to ease into that if it's a new relationship where they have not worked with you. Um, because as frustrating as it can be to experience a lot of floral shrink from their imports, they know what to expect and they know, they know what they can, what they can count on from those folks generally. Um, that's not the case with a new relationship. They, they want to get to know you and get to know your product and quality and your systems and your schedule every week, set a schedule, stick to the schedule. Don't send out availability on Tuesdays one week and Fridays the next, like that's frustrating for them and they're going to disengage. Um, so, so really, you know, kind of think through, think through that and take a look again at our, our blog, there are resources there. Are there pockets of certain states where wholesale may not be as successful based on location? Definitely. Uh, we're in one of those pockets. So we're in central New Hampshire, right on the Vermont border. There's not a lot going on here. Um, and so, Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that was why we built our collective in the first place was we really wanted to move our product down into the greater Boston area. Um, and, uh, and it just didn't make sense for each one of our farms to be moving independently down into Boston. So we said, well, let's, let's just work together and see if we can figure this out. Um, and it, it's worked great. We have relationships with Whole Foods now. I mean, it, it's, we do bouquet programs. Um, we run a truck down there once a week, um, every week, and it, and it just works really nicely for us. Um, so yes, there are pockets where it is less successful. That is, um, it tends to be more of the rural areas. If you don't have those destination wedding options, if you do, I would say think creatively. Um, we have had this year a lot of restaurants join Rooted um, who are looking to put, uh, you know, basically buy bulk buckets and, um, and put flowers on their tables. Um, we've had folks who are venue planners join and they're, you know, at, at a lot of these venues, there is an event planner and the planner is tasked with doing the florals themselves often. Um, not always, or they have a florist partner. And I would say, you know, if, if you do have a lot of those, that would be a great resource is, you know, if you're thinking about building relationships, go out there, talk to those venues, do it now, not in the middle of wedding season. Um, and, and they can, they can kind of talk you through what that looks like. I would be ready with photos, you know, the same way that, um, an artist has a portfolio. You, you want to do the same thing. You want to have photos of your product, um, Anybody joining Rooted, we ask for the same thing. We're going to go through all of your photos, your social media, if you have it, your website. Um, we screen to make sure that we're bringing on quality producers and, and they are going to do the same thing. And if they aren't, then they should. Um, but, but you should come prepared with, with photos of, of your product. And, and that's, a, that's a great way for you to be thinking outside the box of you know, a brick and mortar florist is think about those venues, think about hotels, um, think about uh, think about other other folks who are buying and consuming florals, but um, but uh, may not fall into the florist category. So I was actually going to ask you a quick question on that. I know we're seeing a boom in cut flower growers. I was going to ask you if we're seeing a boom in florists, but um, maybe is there a boom in florists, or is it are we seeing more of these individual venues or restaurants, things like that? as far as more non-traditional ways to move flowers? Um, 
I don't know if I'd call it a boom in florists. I would say it's a shift in florists for sure. Um, I think uh, I think between sort of the the exodus from retail stores and COVID, um, the the makeup of the floral industry changed and and is continuing to change. And I think you know the economics of maintaining a retail shop, a brick and mortar shop, um, are hard. They're hard because it's you know that that is uh, it's a lot of pressure on florists to just absorb that overhead cost. Um, so, you know, whereas, you know, the, the sort of baby boomer generation that is now retiring tended to fall more into that brick and mortar florist <clears throat> category and, and had a studio, um, the new generation that's sort of taking, taking off now and stepping into this space, they tend not to have the brick and mortar studios, or maybe they'll have like a very small studio space, but not actually a retail space. Um, and so they will run like bouquet subscriptions for their retail customers. And then they'll do, you know, kind of um, like corporate partnerships that, where they're doing big floral installations and then they do their event design, but it's out of like a very small studio or even a home studio. Um, and we have florists up here who they're working out of their garages. So, you know, I think it, it, it's not necessarily a boom in florists, that we're seeing, I, I think what we see is a very big shift from what that model looked like to, to what it is, um, what it seems to be evolving into. But it's great to see the buyers are there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, our buyer network is growing exponentially. Um, our wholesale buyer network, it's, we are very much uh, supply constrained. We, we need more growers and more product because we've got, we've got a lot of florists who are looking for it. You guys hear that? That's so exciting. <laughs> All right. Well, I know we only have Amelia until 2.30, but boy, she has packed a lot into an hour. Um, any quick last questions? Okay, well, Amelia, thank you so much. And Carla for being uh, the wing woman there for us and answering all the questions and <laughs> providing with the resources. I think what we'll do is take another quick five minute break. Um, and for those of you who are interested, we're just gonna open it up and talk about our favorite places to shop. Maybe some tips for getting better pricing on um, things than you might get in the traditional outlets. Um, so let's, uh, for those of you who want to join us, we'll be back at 2.35. Thanks so much again, Dave and Amelia. You're welcome to stay, but I know you were both very busy and both super amazing people. And we so appreciate all you're doing for the community. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great to join you, but I do have to get back to real work. So <laughs> <laughs> have, the okay. rest of the day. have a nice day. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.